I'm coming, brother. I can get my bearings together. Everyone loves a title. 
And in fact, some people, that's the reason they do things is because they want that title. They don't necessarily want to do the job. They want the title. If you go through many different churches throughout the um, United States, you're going to find Bishop so-and-so, Bishop so-and-so, um, uh, Pastor so-and-so. Everybody wants that title. But when we're talking about these, these are more than just titles. This is a calling. And when we look at the titles of apostle and prophet, they do appear side by side in Scripture. If someone would please read Luke 11.49. Luke 11.49. So, we all know that in the Old Testament, the prophets were slain. They weren't exactly the most like group. But, in Ephesians, cha uh, Luke chapter 11 and verse 49, we see them side by side, and they are lumped in the same category as having to suffer persecution. There are, many other, there are several other references there, but I'm going to be looking at Revelation 18-20 real quick and reading from there. Where the Bible reads, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. We've talked before about the cup of iniquity, the blood of the martyrs, the blood of the prophets. And here we see the prophets and the apostles finally having God avenge them for the persecution that they have endured throughout history. There's one other group of people that we find the title prophet up here beside the scripture that I have noticed anyhow. And that is righteous men. Would someone please read Matthew 10 and 41? Matthew 10 and 41. And we will be looking at this verse in more detail later on. But we are looking at the man who receives the prophet's reward and the man who receives the righteous man's reward. So prophet and righteous man are mentioned in the same passage, side by side. So when we look at a prophet, what comes to mind when you think of a prophet? Now, on a side note, 
can God speak to anybody directly? Or must he go through a prophet? He can speak to anybody. The prophet has a calling on their life. They're a little bit different and distinct. But the same voice of God, the same clarity that they hear God's voice, you and I can hear that in our own lives too. We don't need to go to a prophet. We don't need to go to a priest to hear what God says for us. The only way somebody might have to do that is if they're not living the way they're supposed to be living. But none of us should be in that boat. So the prophet is a man or a woman of God who knows God's voice, but does one other thing. The prophet is not just somebody who has the ear of God and knows God's voice, but their ministry is to deliver God's message. So they are to know God's voice, hear God's voice clearly. And when I say they don't know God's voice, I'm talking about Elijah in the cave know God's voice. An earthquake come and you know that that, that wasn't God. Something else come and you know that's not God getting a hold of you, brother Elon. But you know the voice of God. You know when God is speaking. You know when God is moving. I know one minister. And he also found when God looked up somebody. And he said, Well, I don't know what that is. Absolutely. Confirmation. But I know one minister that was sitting in the church. She, now this falls more kind of knowing God's voice and discernment. But. There was a prophecy given tongues or interpretation. And she said within herself, God, that sounds like you, but that's not you. So we're talking about the prophet is the one who knows God's voice. Because what does the devil do? Sometimes he comes to us as an angel of light. And if we're not careful, it can sound like God's voice, but it's not God's voice. So the prophet knows that they know that they know what the voice of God is, that it is God's voice, but they're also to deliver God's message to the people he has given. Can a prophet deliver a message to a church? Yes. Can a prophet deliver a message to a sinner? Can God have a message directly for that sinner through a prophet? Yeah. Absolutely. Jonah was a prophet, and God didn't tell him to go to his own people. But God told him, go to the Nineveh. Go to the enemies of your, go to your enemies. Tell them to get right. So the prophet delivers God's message regardless. The prophet is the second highest calling when it comes to the gifts that God, Christ has given to the church. And when we look at that word prophet, in the original language, in the Greek, it means a foreteller and inspired speaker. So, and that's exactly what they are. The prophet is an inspired speaker or an extension of God. They deliver God's message. And then we can go through, I, when I study, you all know I like to break it apart and dig it, split it apart. So when we look at the word that was translated from the Greek word, we also get the word prophet, prophets, prophets, as in possession, like this is mine. Those are the three words that the Greek words were that the Greek word prophets, and it sounds the same way, but spelled a little bit different in the Greek. That's the way it was translated. So, what is the mission of the prophet? I love the way that this commentary had it stated. A commentary on the Holy Bible, that's the name of it, defining prophet as the prophet's object is to show the power of Jehovah to deliver the people from captivity. When we look at us as Christians, we are to go out evangelizing the lost, telling them that they need Jesus. And what is the confirmation that what we have is real? What do you think is the confirmation on us as Christians that what we have is the real deal? We have the Bible, but if we did not have the Bible, there is still something that is supposed to follow people that are Christians 
to verify that what they have is real and that God is real, that their God is real. What's that? Not just the Holy Spirit. He's the one that performs it, but signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. God will always conform, confirm his children. And that was one of the early signs that what the apostles, what the early church had was real. That their God, Jehovah, was real. It wasn't Zeus. It wasn't Aphrodite. If we go back to Samuel, it wasn't even Daniel. <laughs> but signs and wonders shall follow them that believe because it is a confirmation on what they have is real. And there is no denying it. And even those that know the devil's voice, when the signs and wonders come forth, they may perform powers through the devil or have the devil perform miracles throughout their own lives to try to vindicate their message. But even they will stop and take notice that, hey, if it is truly God, they have something I know. We, still, we saw that in the Samaria revival, I believe it was in Acts chapter 8. Remember the sorcerer that tried to, when he saw things being done, he saw the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He tried to buy it. He was someone who had the power of the enemy that practiced it, but he knew that what the apostles had was something great. And he wanted it. And they ended up rebuking him. So the prophet's object is to show the power of Jehovah to deliver the people from captivity. The prophet hears directly from God and he knows, or she knows, his voice. The prophet's, prophet delivers the message of God in multiple fashions. And we can see this throughout the word of God. If we would try to stop and think for a moment, especially looking at the Old Testament, how have we seen the prophets deliver the message of God? Well, what are some of the Old Testament prophets? Elijah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Ezekiel. How did these men deliver their message? How did God have them to deliver their message that he gave them? Through the anointing of God. Through the anointing of God. But what about a little bit more? I, I'm looking for a little bit more because... The inspired man, the man of God should do everything through the uh, would do, should do everything through the anointing of God and the power of God. At this point in time, that's the given. So, what are some other ways that they might deliver the message of God? One should be very obvious. Mom already alluded to it this morning. Prophets. What's that? Prophets. Yeah, how did they deliver their message? They went out and started preaching to people. They started speaking to people. So we would say they started with a verbal uh, deliverance of God's message. And you start mentioning Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Um, when we say verbal, it was outright, especially Isaiah. What's the first six chapters of Isaiah about? Uh, first five, I'm sorry. Woe to you, Israel. Woe to you. you. Basically, if we were to get put in today's vernacular, you're sinning, you need to get right with God. It was a direct command. It was a direct message. It wasn't hidden. It wasn't obscure. It was right there, plain and simple. It was a direct verbal message. You need to get right with God. What are some other ways that the prophets have delivered messages in the past? There's a really big obvious one that we're all overlooking. You might have it on your lap. God's Word. God's Word. So if we're looking at God's Word, what might they have done? Yeah. Wrote, it. Wrote it down. So we have direct verbal communication. We need to get right with God. We have a written communication, a uh, written declaration. Which we could basically say is a good portion, I don't say a good portion, but there towards the end of the Old Testament, 
We have the major prophets' writings. We have the writings of the minor prophets. So we have written communication or people needing to get right with God. This needs to be done. Yada, yada, yada. If we go a little bit farther, well, let me say this. How did Jesus communicate some of his teachings to his disciples? What's that? He showed them. But what if God wanted to um, deliver something that was extremely spiritual that he knew his disciples weren't going to get? So he had to break it down. What do we call that? A parable. Do we have any of the prophets speaking in parables? We sure do. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. There's a really famous king. In fact, the Israelites declare him their first king. Not Saul, but this person. Was it David? David. <laughs> and David messed up. Big time. In fact, his, it's his biggest folly that we know of. That is recorded in scripture. In fact, we have a whole song dedicated to from David's heart describing his feelings and his emotions concerning the situation. And what is the situation? If you think of David and mess up, what comes to mind? Why is it numbering the people? David was told not to number the people, and he did it anyhow. But no, we don't remember any other things that David might have messed up and got things wrong with God, but we remember the sin of Bathsheba. Now, with Bathsheba, it wasn't just the act of committing adultery, but what else did he do in this whole thing? He had her husband killed. So, he sins and lies with Bathsheba. He kills her husband. And David goes on everyday life I wouldn't say like it's nothing, because really, we don't know what was eating up inside David during this time. But what happens with sin in people's life over time? If they hide it and they suppress it, yes, they feel better and better. And maybe they don't even remember it, really. It might be there at the forefront, but they don't give much thought to it. So in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 12, we almost get the image of David. I don't know exactly where he is. Maybe it's in the scripture. I did read it last night, but I may be forgetting some details. But let's just say David's sitting on his throne. And he's going about his everyday life. And somebody comes to visit him. You want to, do you remember he comes and visits David? I'm starting to pour now. Who? There's a prophet by the name of Nathan. Nathan comes. And Nathan doesn't come and say, Hey, David, you sinned. But he sits down and he tells a story about this shepherd who has one little you. That's all he has. But then there's another shepherd that has a hundred sheep. And what does he do? He gets his eye off that one sheep and he looks at that one you. And he takes that view. And what is David's response? Why, he's outraged. Who did this? We need to make this right. And in a sense, we almost feel, get a sense of David's flawed justice. Because we all know that there's an unrighteous, but God, God is the only just God. Uh, only just individual in the entire universe that can make a clear, conscious decision without any bias. And David all of a sudden wants to do this and do this, and then Nathan goes, it's you. The one. You're the one. If he had come in right then and there and said, David, you said I know what you did, David might have had his heart hard, hard. He might not have gotten the message the way that God wanted to get through. So we have a prophet coming through and saying, you know what, king? Let me tell you a story. So we have prophets declaring messages directly, verbally, writing them down, and even illustrations. And if we go even farther, 
There were nonverbal illustrations. I don't, I forgot to look them up and I at least put a reference. But if you remember, I think it was Ezekiel. God had him lay on his side for so many days and then flip over to the other side. There were other illustrations. So there were nonverbal illustrations as well that God had the prophets do. It wasn't always the most comfortable for them, but they were delivering God's message in the way that God instructed them to. So there's all kinds of ways that prophets deliver messages. Um, the next two we're going to combine a little bit. Let's talk about the prophet's reward. The prophet's reward. Do you remember in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 41, that verse we read this morning? Um, what, someone go ahead and just find that. We'll read that, and then we'll build off of that. Matthew 10, 41. But it was the Holy Ghost working in it, and it was God honoring His word. 
We can say many things of our own vernacular. We can go out and we can demand the, the sick to be healed like that. But does it always happen like that? No, the sick does not always get miraculously healed. It is the power of God that heals an individual. Anything that we do is not of our own power, but it is because of the power through the Holy Ghost. It, and it all comes back to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who is seated at the right hand of the Father, and the connection with us is that we are joint heirs with Him. If in this Christian walk, God would have said that you would be nothing more than mere peasants, we wouldn't have that power. We really wouldn't. It all comes down because we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And this power is not our own. And it cannot be bought. We see the, that being the, uh, that um, the source are trying to do that in Acts chapter 8 through 18. But the power that the prophet receives is heavenly. Even when we look at the life of Elijah. When it comes to the great things of Elijah's life, what is probably the one thing that we know about Elijah? What is the greatest accomplishment that Elijah ever did in his lifetime? What's the thing that comes to mind? I know I'm calling for specific. Well, what does the New Testament quote Elijah about doing? Elijah was a man of like passions who He didn't command it to come into existence through his own power. 
more likely he was in prayer with God. The power that the prophet has is not his own. He cannot go around blabbing and grabbing things. He cannot say, you know what, you did a good thing for me, brother Eli, so I am going to give you a mansion with a Porsche. You'll have all kinds of servants. That's not his to give. But maybe there's something that brother Eli desires. And he, the prophet, the man of God goes to God and says, you know what? God, brother Eli has been more than good to me. Will you grant him this reward? Will you bless him with this? The power that the prophet's reward comes through is not the prophet himself, but it's through God. He himself must pray. But there is such a thing as a prophet's reward. Now keep in mind that a prophet's reward is not always tangible. It is not always something we're going to receive in this lifetime. If we go back, in fact, if we connect the prophet's reward and the righteous man's reward with any passage, it would have to be connected with Matthew 25, 34 through 40. And we're not going to read it for the sake of time, but this is the passage that says that if you've done anything to the least of these, you've done also unto me. I was hungry, and you fed me. I needed a place to stay, you gave me shelter. These are things that are not out of the ordinary, they're nothing great, but it's rather, if we want to put it for lack of better terms, it is man helping man. You see somebody that needs a need, maybe the lady in line in front of you at the grocery store, She's short two dollars. You don't think she has it, or even if she does, you give them your two dollars. The Bible says that we entertain angels unaware. But regardless of what we do, we will receive our reward either in this lifetime or in heaven. Honestly, I'd rather see you receive my, my reward in heaven because I, there's much greater things in heaven than there are in this earth. But a prophet's reward, what is a prophet's reward? It is not something that the prophet can give out of his own will or even bring it into existence on his own. But he must go to God through prayer. And I keep in mind, prayer is nothing but communication with God. So if he says, you know what, in the name of Jesus, let it be done, versus going into a prayer closet, and still talking with God. That's still prayer. He's still communicating with God because if God says no, guess what's not going to happen? Everything's still done through the power of God. But a prophet's reward is something that God gives an individual for their treatment of the prophet, whether it be in this lifetime or the following. There were people throughout the Word of God that got their reward in this life. The Shunammite woman, she got the son that she wanted. And when he died, the prophet brought, her back, brought him back to life. There's the woman with the cruise of oil that gave the prophet food first. Whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done also to me. And what did the power of God do? Not because of the prophet's command, but because of the power of God, through the whole time of famine, that cruise of oil and that meal never ended. That was the prophet's reward. Once again, emphasis, the prophet's reward is a reward for something that someone has done for the prophet. It could be a reward that is tangible that we receive in this lifetime. It could be something that we receive when we enter into heaven. Whatever it is, be it known, it cannot be brought to pass through the will and the command of the prophet alone. It is something that is done through the Holy Ghost. Whether God decides what the reward is and we receive it in eternity, or whether the prophet prays it into existence through the power of the Holy Ghost. And when I say praise it into existence, I'm not talking of a selfish will, but I'm saying that God grants his prayer. He answers that prayer. And because of the prophet's prayer, 
that individual will receive the process reward. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point in time? If not, let us prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels in the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and minds will be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, and that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, Lord. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be prepared, that they be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would take that it would take root in our hearts, that we would be transformed even farther into the very image of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians, that you give them a special blessing as they praise upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing. I'm knowing the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth the word today. And we pray, Lord, that you just give him a special blessing as well. We pray, Lord, that the, the attack the enemy would be hindered in every way, that the angels would be set at the four corners of the property, Lord, that no attack may penetrate, Lord. But may the Holy Ghost reign supreme in this place today, Lord. May he have preeminence, Lord, that we would just be drawn closer to you than ever before, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would just experience a mighty move of the Holy Ghost today like never before, Lord. Awaken us in body, mind, and spirit, Lord. That we would realize that the days are short. That we must work before it's too late, Lord. Equip us, strengthen us, encourage us today. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus.